Welcome back. <sighs> I'm cold. I'm not, I'm not made for this weather. <laughs> uh, for the last two days, we've been talking about minding the gaps. The gaps in gender equity, the gaps between the present we know and the futures we seek, and most of all, most of all, the realities of our industry. Sometimes the gaps are the biggest when we open a new restaurant, and I think our next guest is likely to agree. She has spent more than half of her life in the restaurant industry. She is the first female chef to obtain and retain a three Michelin star. She's also a member of the Order of the British Empire, which seems really fancy. I don't... <laughs> And she's also the current holder of the much-discussed title, World's Best Female Chef. <laughs> Last year, she opened her restaurant, Core, in London, and now she's here to talk about this journey with us. Please join me in a warm welcome for Claire Smith. Hi, good afternoon. Um, really delighted to be here and uh, heard some really inspirational things so far. Um, I obviously would like to thank Rene and Melena for inviting me over. Um, so today I'm just going to ex share with you my experience of opening a restaurant over the last 12 months. So Core opened its doors on the 1st of August in 2017. Uh, in fact, we just celebrated our first birthday, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, so we all begin the process of opening a restaurant with a vision in mind. So we know what we want that restaurant to be, what we want it to feel like. We may not know exactly the color of the bathroom tiles or the fabric of the seats, but we know how we want our guests to feel. But the reality is often something very different. So it's about closing the gap between our vision and what reality deems possible. Sometimes that gap gets wider, <laughs> and sometimes it's very, very close. Certainly through the opening stages of the restaurant, I'd go home and think to myself, what the hell have I done? <laughs> um, so I'd like to talk, call this talk the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, but I'm going to start with the bad, because we like to keep the good to the, to the last. Okay, so for be before opening Core, I was a chef at restaurant Gordon Ramsay for almost 10 years, and I had worked in three Michelin star kitchens for 15 years of my life. Given my background, people expected me to carry on with a high-end French classical style of cooking. I had maximized all British guides, um, and was only a handful of chefs to ever have done so. So when Core was opening, it was one of the most anticipated openings in years. Now, my story is a little bit different because when I left restaurant Gordon Ramsay, 99% uh, of my team was still there. My dishes were still on the menu, and I left 10 years of my work behind to start something new. And I wasn't planning to go down the route that people expected. I was going for something much more relaxed, and to be honest, a restaurant that I could afford to open, and something that wouldn't go bankrupt in the first few years. I put everything into it, and, and I couldn't afford for it to fail. So this being my first solo restaurant, I really wanted to do everything myself. Part of the reason I was leaving, working for a, a major group, was I wanted to prove to myself as a chef that I could really do, start something new. So I want to do everything myself, from the business plan, the designs, the finances, finding the right site, dealing with agents, how much risk I was prepared to take on it. All of it took you know, a good year, and I had to fight very hard to fit my vision into my budget, and then you realize that that's just not going to happen. So you squeeze and squeeze and squeeze everything. You, you deal on every single plate and every piece of cutlery and you try to fit it in to your vision. So all of this, of course, is before any work had begun. 
And anyone that ever opened a restaurant will tell you that 95% of your time is worrying about things that you've never dreamed of. So my planning permission was declined three times <laughs> to replace an extract system with a newer, quieter, more environmentally friendly one. Our neighbors opposed our alcohol license. Legal and accountancy fees stacked up, and they are expensive. You know, when you have to go to hearings to get your license, you didn't budget for that. But lawyers cost a fortune. So per hour, you've already spent so much money by the time you've even started the building. But then the builders moved in. <laughs> okay, so I want to show you just a little bit so you can get an understanding of, of core. So getting the keys to my first restaurant, it's a big moment in everyone's lives that's ever done this, going through that front door, finding a site that meant something to me that felt good was very, very important. Unfortunately, uh, this was very all on, on sound, so this is what we ended up with. So this is actually the kitchen. So you can see there's some pretty major structural things happening. Needless to say, it's quite a considerable project. We wanted to remove structural pillars, supporting walls to open up the space. The building was built in 1861, so you can imagine. And many challenges, drains collapsing, foundations crumbling, and I thought we'd given ourselves plenty of time to open. We were scheduled to get the building back and completed by the 7th of June. I thought we would set the opening date for the 1st of August, and that would give us plenty of time to get the team trained up. So 7th became the 20th, and then that became the 7th of July, and so on. In the end, it was like being in a very slow crash. All I could see was the wall in front, and we were going to hit it hard for sure. But there was nothing we could do to stop it. 1st of August, bookings were open, and we were already fully booked for weeks. We had no choice but to somehow open. Everybody I spoke to said, don't worry, it's always like that. When you open a restaurant, guests are walking in when the paint's still wet. And literally, that's what happened. We managed to get in about three soft opening services before we opened. And one of those, I was the only guest because I was so upset with how the first one went. I canceled the next one and I walked through every single step with my team about how I wanted the restaurant to feel. I'd been so used to working in such a tight, regimented system that anyone who joined us at Restaurant Gordon Ramsay very quickly got molded into that system. It wasn't like that now. We had to create the systems for ourselves. I couldn't just turn around and tell people what I wanted and expect them to deliver because they didn't know. There was only three others in the kitchen that had previously worked with me. We had to really, really go back to basics and learn to communicate, training the team to become who I needed them to be took time. They don't just arrive with the skill set and knowledge required getting them to understand the vision, the feel connected to us and the guests, suppliers, that takes a lot of work. We had to inspire them. We had to get them to buy into it. I had to take them by the hand and show them my vision, working with them every step of the way. And we all know that training never, never stops. But we had to start so far behind. <laughs> To be the best, you've got to train every day and continue to share your knowledge. Through all of this, I remained quite calm because I had been through shit before <laughs> and I fought my way out of it. I knew that losing my temper would only shake the team further and this is where all those years came in. Thankfully, this time I didn't have three Michelin stars to lose. We didn't have any. We opened on the 1st of August as planned, and it was a near disaster. After opening, you would think that things would smooth out a bit. Wrong. We started to lose staff. We just couldn't get the team to knit together. Christmas season hit, and we were in the shit. No way out but just to put our heads down and crack on. So the sous chef fell over and broke his finger. One of the chef de parties fell over and seriously sprained his ankle. The commie on the pastry got bronchitis, which then we had to send her away because it was going to turn into pneumonia. 
The guy on the garnish fell down the stairs at home and got concussion. <laughs> on New Year's Eve, we barely got ready for service. There was a special menu, high expectations, but I was determined to have fun, which was always something I wanted at the very heart of core. We dressed all the chefs up in hats and bow ties. We, it was a tough service, but we got through it. We had a live band, we cleared the tables away, and we got the whole team dancing with the guests. Now, I realized it's always important, no matter how shit things are, that if people give you everything, you can't ask for more. You've got to be grateful for that, and you've got to lead your team and celebrate it. And you have to let your hair down and say thank you. So now, the ugly part. Everyone thinks that's pretty ugly. <laughs> but the, the ugly part's more personal, because we can deal with being in the shit. But personal stuff, is, is, it, it sticks. So, from the moment we opened our doors, food critics were falling over themselves to get in. And my first review was written on our opening night in a major tabloid newspaper. The headline read, all the food that you can tweet, just when you thought restaurants couldn't get any more ridiculous, along comes core. <laughs> the critic wrote, naturally, there is an open kitchen where chefs use gilded tweezers to garnish these dwarf-sized dishes with microherbs, whilst wearing the expression of someone performing open-heart surgery on a dying puppy. She thought that I was having a laugh, charging £95 for a tasting menu, and that the scallop that she had for her main course was overcooked. Perhaps, she wrote, the team were too busy ironing the petals of an edible pansy to notice. All of the ingredients on the menu couldn't have cost more than a fiver. <laughs> OK, never mind. OK, we weren't actually serving scallops as a main course. The extra-large hand-dyed scallop cost more than a fiver, and anyone knows that. Um, anyone with primary school uh, maths can work out that a 50-seater restaurant in Notting Hill in London that employs more than 40 people would realize that £95 for a tasting menu is actually incredibly good value. We have to take in consideration 20% of that is VAT. Now, the truth is that that critic didn't even step foot in my restaurant. What actually happened, there was a man in grey hair waiting outside the restaurant for the doors to open. When we opened, he pretended to be invited by my PR company. I overheard the conversation, went over to the man, introduced myself. He said he was a local and just wanted to try out the restaurant. I said, sure, of course, you're a neighbour. I'm never going to turn a neighbour away, and I always said that core, I will feed everyone. So I said, why don't you take a seat at the bar, bearing in mind this is our opening night, and we are rammed full. We've got everyone in. <laughs> and I said, don't worry, I'll feed you a couple of dishes, just being neighborly. 30 minutes later, Claire and uh, Pierre Kaufman walked in, and Claire said to me, be careful, that's a food critic's husband sitting at the bar. And I said, oh, don't worry, I'm, I'm just being neighborly. He was just in the neighborhood. So I just made him a couple of dishes. So the critic wrote the review based upon her husband's experience. Now, of course, I called my mentor, <laughs> Gordon. He said sewer. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I couldn't understand what I had done to this person and why she wanted to stick the knife in. Now, I was used to quite a lot of heat working with Gordon for so long. Uh, he used to wind people up on purpose, but why me? This wasn't the only one. There were others that I squeezed in for a favor. They wrote shitty things. I found it very disheartening that they would use our hospitality for a cheap headline, whilst missing pretty much everything that we were trying to do. We did receive great reviews also, but by our own nature, we never remember those, just the bad ones. I couldn't get over why anyone was so horrible after the nightmare we had endured during the opening. 
Nobody wanted to give us a chance, or it seemed that way. I left home when I was 16, I worked hard, I saved my money so that I could open a restaurant to feed people and make them happy. I employed 40 people trying to be sustainable as possible. I wanted to create a good working environment. We were serving less meat and fish on the menu, championing the vegetable to be responsible. Sure, the acoustics weren't great when we opened, but did that need to be the point of someone's article? I fixed the problem quite easily weeks after opening, and I couldn't understand well, why do they get pleasure out of being so harsh? Does it make them feel good or more important? Then there were the neighbours who loved to complain constantly, phoning the council, complaining about noise, cooking smells. Of course, some of those uh, days that they complained, we weren't even opened. I pointed out that maybe one of the other neighbours was making themselves a bacon sandwich or somebody had a barbecue, but of course my sarcasm didn't go down very well. But really, some people seemed to be professional complainers and it felt that like everyone was against us and no one was pro-business. Now, I understand 95 pounds means a lot to people. It's a lot of money to pay, but restaurant margins are incredibly thin. Or do cooks, waiters, dishwashers not discern, deserve to earn a decent wage like all those accountants and lawyers that I had to pay? Or should we dredge the oceans and keep animals in cages so you can get a cheaper meal and we can work in basements? We really should be able to run successful businesses economically and environmentally sustainable. In order for our industry to survive, we need to be able to pay people a decent wage. And I'm really determined to make core that place. We need to keep educating people in the correct way. We need to talk about the real costs of running a restaurant. Somehow get those critics to understand and buy into it. The ugly moments of opening a restaurant are the ones where you feel that maybe the gap is simply too large to bridge. Maybe the world we hope to create as chefs and restaurant owners isn't possible in this age. Can we ever pay our people enough? Can critics and chefs be in a conversation rather than conflict? It's enough to drive many people from the industry. Costs can easily run away, and at some point you have to force an opening, regardless of builders and contractors. Because if you give them more time, they'll take it. You know, months slip away when you're paying rent, business rates, and staff. Sure, you can make a claim against them, but lawyers cost money. Good luck ever actually getting it back, because they'll go bankrupt and pop up somewhere else. Meanwhile, how many guests will you have to serve to make back that 100, 200, or 300,000 pounds. You have to take a leap of faith and know that you'll get there quickly even if the opening isn't how you want it to be. You just have to believe in yourself and put the work in. That's why you should never judge a restaurant when it opens, yet so many people do. Now I'll get to the good bit. This bit's the shortest. Because <laughs> we always focus on the negative, it's a human nature. Okay, luckily I've always been a bit of a fighter. Negative reviews spur me on. Rather than calling out the critics like I was looking bitter, it fuels me to make them look ridiculous from cause of success. Over the last 18 months, most of my senior staff and I have worked non-stop, not because we can't take a break, but because we don't want to. We're committed to making a restaurant as good as it can be, as quickly as we can, and I just won't be happy sitting around a pool when there's so much work to do. The good side of a restaurant is not financial reward or fame or awards. Maybe that will come, maybe it won't. What feels good is wiping the slate clean and starting again, creating something new and watching it come to life, new dishes, a new identity. You get to learn who your audience is and who supports you. A large number of old colleagues came back to me after some years of working apart, they were just waiting for the call. Some who had staged at RHR had joined us from all over the world. It was like a family getting back together. I'm going to show you some of those family. There they are. People. That's what Ben was saying earlier about the individual and appreciating every individual member of your team as a person and the part they have to play. All the people that helped us, all the suppliers that believed in what we were doing. All a part of it, and there's the team. 
Now, after our rocky start, I really reflected on what I had done. I questioned everything I was doing and realized that what I thought was important and not. I learned to strip back the layers, go back to basics of communicating with my team and my guests. For all of the ratings and accolades in the world, nothing is more important and valuable than the people around you and the food community. I learned to listen to people's feedback, but really for the first time. Whether I took it or not on board, I certainly considered it. We knocked down the kitchen wall because I wanted to say hi to all of our guests. We spent time really talking to suppliers for the first time. We invited them all to core so they could meet each other, share their passion and knowledge. This is how you bridge those seemingly impossible gaps, by leaning on those around you, those who've survived it too. We can't make it by ourselves. We have to open our minds and our arms to those around us and ask for help and give it out as well. Like I say, the rewards are not guaranteed, but I can tell you there's something magical about doing something that's your own and watching people embrace it. I've seen the stiffest of guests from RHR, real connoisseurs who dine in three-star restaurants globally, come to core and trainers, and they love it more. <laughs> and it's amazing when you strip the layers away, how people become themselves and how we become ourselves. We cooked for 20,450 people in our first year. People coming to my restaurant and supporting me has been more valuable than anything I've ever won or been awarded before, and I genuinely never realized that before opening Core. I try to thank all of them personally and have genuinely been blown away by their support and feedback. One of my all-time favorite guests beat cancer right recently and was able to celebrate her 84th birthday with us. It's moments like that when you remember why we do this. It's to see these people having fun and being a part of special moments in their life and for them to be a part of ours also. And that's it, bring on year two. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.